So why male models? Think about it, Derek. Male models were genetically constructed to become assassins. They're in peak physical condition. They can gain entry to the most secure places in the world. And most important of all, models don't think for themselves. They do as they're told. That is not true. Yes, it is, Derek. OK. Yeah. Think about any photo shoot you've ever been on. You're a monkey, Derek! You're a monkey! Dance, monkey! In your little spangly shoes! Smash your symbol, Simpy! Dance, Derek! Dance! Good point. But if this has been going on for so long, Mugatu... Well, he's just a punk-ass errand boy working for an international syndicate of fashion designers. You do a little background check on your Mr. Mugatu, you'll find that he sold his soul to the devil for a shot at the big time. But why male models? You serious? I just... I just told you that a moment ago. Right. Secure podcast. My name's Mike. Hi, I'm Emma. This is episode 61, The Advantage of Modeling. Why male models? Derek Zoolander. Gonna love it. We're going to be talking about a fairly contentious topic um, that we've been putting off and putting off and putting off. I still don't know why we're doing it now. Um, and that is modeling for advantage. Now, this is going to specifically rate, relate to our experiences dealing with this problem in Warhammer 40,000 as TOs and as players to some degree. Um, I don't know how far down the rabbit hole we'll go, but I've got a few examples and a few a few thoughts and some conflicting things, and it all ties into the game system and, and line of sight, and yeah, I don't really know how to articulate it, so we'll just pick a point at when, when we hit the main topic and go from there. Hmm. Uh, in the meantime, we did have a, we've had a short turnaround between this episode and the last. Yep, just one week. Yep. Uh, and that was due to some scheduling issues that we had with the last episode. So mm-hmm. you get a double treat. And, <laughs> if you're, and if you're a patron, you've you've had three in the space of like 10 days. So hope you enjoy this episode. Uh, we're going to cover some of the quick news and current events and bits and pieces that have been happening now. Um, I'm going to start with a tournament I finished yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um, hosted by the Toy Soldier Cartel uh, at Qdale Tavern which I actually forgot. I meant to get a pot of paint while I was at the Kudale Tavern because um, this particular tavern with a drive through bottle shop and everything sells Games Workshop stuff. So you can go and get your beer and your hobby and then drive home. <laughs> so, Do they sell the paints and stuff in the drive through yeah, Well, the photos I've seen have it in the drive through yeah. That's very which cool. Which is amazing. I love it. So um, this was, like I say, hosted by the Toy Soldier Cartel. And 20 players, three rounds, ITC missions. Um, so the same missions that we had for LVO 2020 because um, mm-hmm. the new format for ITC isn't released yet. And they marked my second through fourth ITC format games in over a year. <laughs> and so you had one practice game. But not with this not army. With this, no, and I was about to say, and these were the, literally the first, second and third games with this army. Yeah, so if you've read the Tabletop Tournament Prep Guide or listened to any of the 10 episodes where we go through the Tabletop Tournament Prep Guide in the patrons group, uh, this is 100% not what we talk about doing. <laughs> so uh, I got the army to table, to table ready, to battle ready. Um, and when was that battle ready? Um, probably a good... 12 to 16 hours before. Really? So you weren't hitting it with spray? No, no. 
Oh, I thought I could smell it when I got up in the morning. No, no, that was I was spray painting some stuff for the Age of Sigmar armies that the kids are painting. All oh, right, <laughs> which we'll talk story. about in a second. No, the um, the the wraiths all got to battle ready. Um, the rest of the models I was using were all painted anyway from various elder armies across the years. Um, a couple of models got rearmed because the weapons weren't legal anymore, or the combinations had changed over the years. But um, it let me play three really fun games. Um, it let me game one. I tried a particular tactic, which I'll, I'll be filling into an article and expanding on the games and whatnot. That kind of worked, and then the army ran out of steam by turn three. And then uh, game two, it went better. Mm. But both my opponent and I agreed for game two. The chances are that I'd probably run out of steam around turn five. But um, luckily, you didn't get to turn five. No, so we didn't get to turn good. five. Game game one and game three both finished turn six. Mm. Um, and then game three, uh, probably was my highlight of the day. It was a really fun game. It was a player I'd never played before, mm-hmm. and. Uh, it was an army I'm not used to seeing across the table. Like none of none of my regular friends or opponents play them. I knew most of the tricks, and um, yeah, we we had this weird back and forth where um, my wraith blade squad with axes just would not die under any cons- like there were ten of them to start the game. At the end of turn six, there were still three, yeah. and they had been in combat since turn one when he charged me. I think I'd had. I maybe had one of my six turns, which was the final turn they weren't in combat. So they probably suffered through somewhere between seven and ten rounds of combat across the whole game. They killed two brood lords, the Swarm Lord, Old One Eye, a Tyranid Prime, a bunch of Tyranid Warriors. They anything that came near them, they smacked. Mm-hmm. And um we were both a bit astounded by this sequence of events because normally Old One Eye and Gene Stealers and all the rest of them which made combat would tear through these units. And mine refused to die. So, uh, but when you uh, and I've got screenshots from um, from the scoring app that I'm going to post to show you when I scored what, and it was really interesting to watch the games because turns one and two, I in all three games I got good scores out of turns one, two, and uh, one and two. Mm. Three and four were bad, and then in the case of game one, five and six just got worse. Mm-hmm. But in game three. It's like I, I, the army struggles in the mid mid game at the moment. Mm. And well, I'm not 100 percent sure you can say that, given you've only played three games, and in your first game, it struggled in the mid game and struggled in the end game, and so I'm not sure that you can say that you no. strengthen in the latter part of the game. So you have no. a strong start, consistently across all three games that you've so far played. I'm not sure you've got enough data to make any no. kind of. Um, but it, assumptions or but I've already got that. plans to revise it but now that the army is battle ready and I can field it as it is mm. um, I'm going to pack it all back into the dungeon so that I can just pull the tray out and play it mm-hmm. and um, set the airbrush booth up for the warlord and get the warlord done because everyone's been nagging me so now I'm going to do it it was a very expensive model it was and it I don't is. want you to just just do it and no. get it done and fine, whatever. No, it's not going to be... You have to get enjoyment out of it as well. No, it's not going to be just fine and get it done or anything like that. It's going to be masked off properly and airbrushed and all the rest of it. It's going to be done properly. Um, because I want to... Um, I had one of our patrons, Steve, who owns a Warlord himself. And he's in the process of building and painting it. Say he wants to run it for our July event for Armadale. So, 6,000 points... Um, for the Apocalypse event. So I've said to him, all right, I'll up the points and adjust the format so that you can field a single Warlord at that level. And that'll be the ringer. I'll bring the Warlord. So that that way there'll be two of them wandering around the room. Possibly. Possibly. There might be more. There are several in Perth now. There might be less if we don't need a ringer. That's true. So anyway, that's going to be the the hobby project. I've got that in one commission that I'm going to put into the airbrush booth and just get the commission done, get the Titan underway, and that's going to be my hobby focus for the foreseeable future. I'm going to stop magpieing and get it done mm. until something comes out. Yeah, exactly. But I'll do my best. Um, we're getting to the age of Sigma, aren't we? <laughs> the next thing to magpie with. 
Well, Age of Sigma, they still haven't given me the, the rest of the Lumineth previews yet. So at the moment, I'm still sort of going, yeah, you know, some of the stories have been really cool and they've hinted at Tyrion, which is the model I'm still hoping they release, which might just push the push it over the edge. Um, I had a box set, um, Storm of Sigma, which is kind of one of the the mini starter box things that Games Workshop did when they first released Age of Sigma. It was um, Bloodborne and Stormcasts. And it's it had like three blood or five blood warriors and three blood something or others. The mm. basically chaos warriors and marauders is the, the terminology I'd use. Mm. And then there were three stormcast and then two stormcast with big hammers. And it was literally like a basic version of the like the basic rules: seven dice because no unit needed more than seven dice when it attacked, and a cardboard six inch ruler because no one had anything that moved further than that. Um, although they didn't think think about charge distances, to be honest. And my or our youngest daughter wanted to paint something, mm-hmm. and um, I found this box and went, "Oh, we'll just you know, she doesn't she doesn't mind what she wants to paint. She just wants to paint cool models." And I gave the them to her and said, "Which ones do you want?" And she wanted to paint the Stormcast, and I said to our son, "Do you want to paint the the Chaos stuff?" And he's not a big fan of that sort of thing normally. Mm. But he went, oh, they're different to Space Marines. Yeah, I'll paint them. So we under- got them all. They, two of them sat down together and assembled stuff. And he helped her. It was really good to see him explaining stuff that he'd been taught. Mm-hmm. They got it all assembled. And they had to play a game. Before I undercoded anything, they had to play a game. Mm-hmm. And Ava said I wanted to go first. He said, no, let's roll for it like the game says. So the seven-year-old and the 13-year-old rolled off. The seven-year-old won. I, expl- I think- I think that's where the start of the bad sportsmanship yes. came in. Because <laughs> that was cheering, I get to go first. And then uh, I explained to her how to move the models and she moved the models. And then she said, how do I, how do I go and hit, the, hit his models? And I said, well, you have to roll your charge, roll your two dice. I had a quick read of the rules to make sure if it was the same as 40k. It's slightly different, but the core of it's basic, the same. And... Um, She's rolled the two dice and it's like a, a 10 inch charge because we just kind of set them up on the kitchen table. Mm. And she's rolled an 11 for the first unit. And then she's said, Can I do it for this, the second unit? Yeah, sure, no worries. 11. So both these units have gone barreling in turn one. They wiped out one of our son's units instantly, mm-hmm. left him with three models. And the game was over. I don't know, five minutes later with her stood there in a skeletal pose with like flexing her arms, like laughing maniacally at the ceiling about how awesome it was when she managed to do all these mortal wounds with these hammers. And that's where the um, conversation around how to be a good sport yes. started, <laughs> which was actually really quite hilarious to listen to from the other room. Yeah. Trying to explain to her, you know, it's you don't have to cackle maniacally when you're winning. And um, I was really impressed with our son though, because he did take it all in good stride and you know he was really well receiving of that he you know he lost well he did he did very well um our daughter didn't um, learn well. anything because then she went on to play against her big sister and, and was basically just as badly <laughs> yeah um what i was impressed with though with him is um he finished painting that first unit of three blood warriors about an hour after i sprayed them mm. and then i said to him i'll i'll undercoat the the other unit of five for you so you can paint them. I undercoated them yesterday morning before the tournament mm. and came home to find them two-thirds painted. Yeah, they would have been finished, but I made him go outside and get some fresh air and go oh, swimming okay. and things like that. So he was um, not impressed that I made him stop. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we've started a little bit of Sigma in the house. I've got that box. Yeah, of- don't think that... I'm buying this. Oh, I just happened to find this box and I, I thought... Didn't, uh, oh, look, I don't know where it came just, from. It was in the dungeon. She could paint these. She won't mind. And now I've got to get an army so I can be a good dad and I can play with my children and I can connect. And you're always talking to me about the importance of connection with children and they want to play with me. So I think I'd better buy an army just so I can play with them. Yeah, right. Just happened to find that box, did you? Yeah. Hmm. Obviously, but she wanted my um my howling banshees, my new howling banshees. I said no. She's seven. You could have gone and got her a three dollar bag of army men from Kmart, spray painted them, and given those to her. Well, not at that moment. I couldn't have because she wanted it then, and she wanted to copy and do what her big brother was doing. Mm. So it had to be proper models. So, um, 
I showed our oldest daughter the um, the box of witch elves that I've got sat there, and she's gone, oh, I really like those. Can I paint those? So then I won't have an Age of Sigmar army if she takes those and paints those, which means I will definitely need to be involved in some way, shape, or form with another army. So we'll see. Um, off the back of our son's good sportsmanship, though, that was actually the highlight of the day for me, was apart from three really awesome games yesterday with um, my three opponents, I was pleasantly surprised and got best sportsman for the day. Hmm. That was very much appreciated from my three opponents. Uh, I know it was counted back because of the way the sports was doing. Um, from what I can gather looking at the results, it was tied with sort of two or three of us on equal sportsmanship votes, and then it was the highest generalship, mm. essentially. So, um, It's always something that we kind of have a conversation about. Do you count back on sports with highest generalship or lowest generalship? You know, you're, is it better to be a good winner or a good loser? I, I would agree, and, and normally when I write players' packs, I put it as highest sports, uh, highest mm. generalship, because in my mind, winning with grace is often harder than losing with it, because it's easy to come across as gloating or come across as arrogant or come across as. Um, well, I think, I think it's the opposite of that. Is that, it's when your opponent loses, you feel a bit sorry for them, so you're more likely to, yeah, mark them up, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to when your opponent wins. No, the game doesn't necessarily feel that great, does it? No, and, and that's the thing. If you're beating people and they're still giving you sports votes, yeah. then that was a good game. So um, I really, like that, all three armies I played yesterday were also really lovely. So Ryan was playing uh, Chaos Space Marines with a Chaos Knight. Um, Iron Warriors themed, lots of conversions, fancy bases, custom cultists. It was a hobby project of his all through 2019. Mm -hmm. And the effort really shows he did win Best Painted. Um, round two was against, Ma against Matt's Adeptus Mechanicus, which I think finished second for painting. I think, it w yes, it was. It was second mm. for painting. Um, like a teal blue uh, Admech army. And I said to him while we were playing, part of the hobby that he does that I I don't know, I can't do it. There is he, he has the ability to look at a model or look at a theme for a model and just build things and convert them and like make brand new models. And while I can convert things, like I can repose them, I can do weapon swaps and all that sort of stuff, his two armies, Orc and Admech, he scratch builds things and like, and they look like they're, they're, they're meant to belong. Mm. And I have this mental hurdle where if it doesn't look exactly the way it should look, then I, I can't deal with that. So when you look at all my armies, yes, there's a bunch of conversions in the Eldar armies and the they're all sleek and clean armies. And I can't do that sort of high-tech cyberpunk style like the, you get with Orcs and Admech. So it's always impressive for me to see those sorts of armies. Um, and then game three with Craig was a Tyranid army that he'd done. Uh, they were like a gloss black carapace with um, like a bony yellow um, bodies and skin. But they were all shiny. So they were like this glisteny, slimy, wet-looking army which I thought really worked well for the, the models that he had. And um, I found a new pro a newfound appreciation for the Exocrine um, from the Tyranid range because I hadn't seen one on the table in I don't know how long. And it was the one model in his army, other than Ripper Swarms, I didn't kill because I very quickly learned... Like, I went to... Uh, he seized on me. I don't think I went first the whole weekend. He seized on me, shot with it. I spent a bunch of resources to make sure it didn't work. I asked it its defensive stats and then instantly decided I'm not even going to bother. Mm. It's going to sit at the back of the board shooting me. I'm just going to let it do that because mm. I can't, I haven't got the guns to shoot and deal with it and I don't mm. have the speed to deal with it. So I just ignore it and hope it goes away. Yeah, pretty much. Um, he got to fire it every turn. There's nothing I could do to stop that. And he shot down both planes with it over the course of four turns, I think it was. And... Like I say, I very rarely see them on the table and I don't know how well it would go against one of my more traditional LR armies where I do have the guns and the, the mobility to deal with it. But the flip side of that is um, his Crack and Gene Stealers had a charge turn one. And most of my elder armies when charged with Crack and Gene Stealers turn one don't like that. Mm. Whereas 
the 20 gene stealers that charged me killed five rangers and one wraith blade and then were wiped out by the rest of the wraith blades in response and we both looked at the table and went oh that's um that's not what either of us expected mm. so yeah it was that was a really fun game it went back and forth and back and forth and um around turn five i managed to eke out a um, he'd already maxed out all of his secondaries by turn four um i didn't actually max out i, I went um i didn't get uh line breaker it was the one i didn't max out because that bloody exocrine wouldn't let me come anywhere near it mm. so and he killed my planes but that's okay um really good day really good day and congratulations to courtney for going three wins despite him being the um the figurehead, the organizer, the but he wasn't founder it. Oh. No, of the Toy Soldier Cartel. Cartel. Um, I know that Travis, who was the to- tournament organizer for that, he was really worried that TSC were going to win their own event. But like I said to him, the group of players there, that that wasn't an issue. I understand the hesitancy because it's one of the things I'm concerned about of going to one of our events. I, yeah, look, I understand. I, no, I don't understand it. Not really. If you're I guess if you're the tournament organiser and you're playing and you win, then maybe. But if, if Objective Secured as a group run an event and you're not the TO for that particular event, well, you're just a person. You yeah, just exactly. happen to be connected to OBSEC. Yeah. So with, you know, I know that um, the sort of three of them took out prizes from two. Two. Two Toy Soldier Cartel took out um, prizes for their different categories, but they both said that they didn't take the prize and they passed them on to... Yeah, they took the trophy or the medal but then didn't take the box sets. Which is noble and everything, but why not? If they paid to participate and they they played in the same way that everybody else, why don't they get to take the prize? I th- as I said, I'm not. It's, that's in no way a criticism. I'm just saying that in my mind, there was nothing wrong with them actually taking a prize. If you're running a fundraising ev- event and you don't pay to participate and you make up the numbers and you win, then I don't think that you can take the prizes for a fundraising event that you're using to fundraise for yourself. Yeah. So that then I can see, yep, there's some conflict there. But if you're doing it as, you know, this is a group of guys who get together and play together, one of those, well, two, because it was Alan and Travis were doing most of the organising in the league. Yeah, and Alan, Alan ended up being the ringer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think well, chances of Alan winning overall were quite slim, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, he they brought him an army, but then didn't bring him dice, tape measures army list like they didn't supply him any of the required tools to play the army but there's quite a few people who come to our events like that so he's there oh, while over i was playing year. while i was playing ryan in round one he's coming over and just taking dice off our table and ryan's looking at him going what are you doing i need to borrow these okay just give them back and at the end of the game he came over and gave all these dice back and ryan but went, we've got how many dice sitting in the center console you had my car didn't you no i had the evo no, you had my car. Oh, no, you're right. I had, yeah, you're right. I took that one. You didn't think to maybe go on the centre console where I've always got at least 30, 40 dice sitting there because well, when at the end of events I empty my pockets and chuck <laughs> them in there? Well, the um, the TSC guys had a bunch of their extra dice there, so he was sorted that way because oh, okay. Ryan brought a bunch with him. But, uh, yeah, the oh, that was I did get to do that at the end of the day as well. Travis was um, taking stuff out to the cars. Um, all of our boards were back in the car and the mats were back in the car. And he came back in and he's walked in. I said, Travis, I've got to I've got to do something here for your first major TOing. And he said, What's that? And I've handed him a couple of dice that were on the floor and on the terrain. And I said, Welcome to the world of collecting dice from being an organizer. And he went, Oh, I picked up three more earlier today as well, and no one's claimed those. I've gone, No. Nope. And you're gonna get more. Yep. We have a small bucket of them. So yeah. Anyway, really good day. Um, it was nice to get out and play again. I um I haven't done that in a long time at a tournament, so it was good. With the dice, at the end of the year last year, we played a silly game at my work Christmas lunch and needed dice for that, and the person who organised it forgot dice, and she was all stressed out. Oh, I haven't got any dice. I was like, oh, hold on a minute, and took out my purse and everything from my handbag and then pulled out a handful of dice from the bottom of my bag and said, <laughs> how many do you need? And people around the table are going, why do you just 
carry dice in your handbag. <laughs> I was like, and why so many? I said, don't you carry dice in your handbag? <laughs> Which is extra funny because when I was growing up, we never had any dice. Like we would always be raiding that game because we needed dice for such and such. And then who can remember where the dice have gone? Oh, that's okay because that game's got it. And you'd have two dice between twenty different board games. Now we've got five thousand dice between. Yeah. Yeah. Well, between we, five of us, we we could play individual Yahtzee with your own set of dice with a hundred people and not run out of dice. Mm. Except we probably wouldn't. more than that. Yeah. Um, anyway, moving on. So, we're going to quickly cover some of the previews and things before we jump into the topic. Um, we have seen uh, a bunch more of the Psychic Awakening, the greater good stuff with the Astra Militarum and the Tau and the Gene Stiller Colts. Most, it's up for pre-order now. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of screen grabs been shared. There's the um, previews that have shown up on YouTube. A lot of it's now been sort of put out there with, you know, build your own Tau Sept, um, build your own uh, Scions, which actually look really interesting. Uh, we've seen... Uh, Adeptus Titanicus released the pre-orders for the Psy Titans, uh, mm -hmm. which is just a variant of the Warlord, mm -hmm. which bodes really interesting things for Forge World if they're going to give us variant parts for the Warlord. Um, I've now seen the data sheet for the new Farsight, uh, not Farsight, for the new Shadow Sun model, which is exciting. And we've seen bits and pieces about the Farsight 8 as well. So there's lots of that sort of stuff creeping through. Um, we've also got the Black Library celebration on the 29th of February, which mm. you'll see some new model releases and some new books, which is exciting. It's actually been quite quiet on the Age of Sigma front, though, because since they did that release at LVO, mm. I haven't seen any more previews for the for the elves. So I'm kind of waiting to see. I know that they said they were going to schedule it and do it like they did with um, Sisters of Battle, but we haven't. I haven't seen another preview. So... Maybe between this publishing and um, now, they'll release it and this will all be incorrect. Yeah. Who knows? Um, Golden Demon. We saw something mentioned about Golden Demon USA on the um, community site as well. And there's some been some little updates for the FAQs for Middle Earth for Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. So lots going on for Games Workshop at the moment. Um, it's But it actually feels a lot quieter at the moment. We, we had... All the stuff, like they've given us a bunch of rules and stuff for Psychic Awakening, but we're only getting Shadow Sun as a model. Mm. And, you know, they've, they've done a few little things for Titanicus and they've previewed a few bits and pieces for um, like the new Necromunda Warbands. And Do you think this is a calm before the storm? Yeah, look, potentially. I we're think we see a massive influx and everybody at the moment, we're not hearing or seeing anything because they're all scurrying around trying to get all their ducks in a row and get everything sorted and well, organized before they they're about to they're about to go into q q4 i think february march eight, no march april may so yeah they mm. they're literally about to enter their fourth quarter mm. for financials so i'm assuming that once we get to march march april may cuz mm. they run um june to Ju june to may i reckon we'll get that last quarter will be full of stuff yeah it'll be quite busy i suspect um so yeah we've you know there's little things like they've released a bunch of the war cry stuff so that you can run um heed knights of slanesh and maggotkin of nurgle and sylvaneth and seraphon so we are getting bits and pieces to add to war cry necromunda you've got the house of chains expansion which has got a whole bunch of the new um, weapons and uh, options for the goliaths which is cool um Blackstone Fortress, they've released another box, or they've got it up for pre-order, I should say, called No Respite. This is an interesting box because the it's three Plague Marines and six Plague... Not Plague Bearers, what are they called? The Zombies. I can't think what their name I is now. I was thinking Plague Bearers as well. No, they're not called Plague Bearers, and I can't think of the name of them. No. Box Walkers. Uh. Um, they're all the easy build ones, and I don't know if these easy builds are still on the shelf... Hmm. So it's um, the Blight Launcher um, easy build Plague Marine, which is really hard to get hold of. This is one of the few places you can get a Blight Launcher. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested to see whether they have removed these two from the easy builds because um, we've got both these boxes. So 
yeah, it's interesting to see them expanding Blackstone down that road as well. So I wonder how many more easy build stuff they can roll in and just give data cards to keep expanding that game. Mm. Um, we've also seen a whole bunch of Middle Earth stuff return to the range, which had been discontinued, which is interesting because it almost felt at one point there like Games Workshop was winding up that license agreement. Mm. Um, but we've now got um, like the Bor- mounted Boromir, Boromir with the banner, Boromir with his sword. Um, a bunch of the wags come back, orcs have come back, dwarves. Um, yeah, it's it's some stuff being added back in, which is great. So, um, I think that's everything, though, news-wise, unless you've got something else you want to add to this little conversation. Nope. By the time this goes out, Varsity will have already happened. Yes, we got Varsity tonight, and then Line Breaker tickets will go up tomorrow. Um, we do have tickets for the event on the 22nd. If you haven't got them, you do need to get them ASAP. Basically, basically this week, mm. because it's looking a little low at the moment, and um, we don't want to have to cancel. No, that's so. right. Well, yeah, I guess by the time this comes out, we'd really like people to have bought tickets. Otherwise, it may have cancelled. Yeah, we'll see. Mm. Hopefully not. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come back and talk about some of the pitfalls of line of sight and modelling for advantage and basing and all that other heavy stuff that's been bandied around a lot on the internet and uh, at our events. Fantastic. I can't wait. (laughs) All right, back in a second. All right, let's talk modelling. No? Too broad? Mm. (laughs) Modelling for advantage then. Let's go back to (laughs) modelling. So modelling for advantage is a phrase that gets bandied around quite a bit. Okay, so let's start with why are we reluctant to talk about modelling for advantage? Because we've been talking about, you know, we should do a podcast on it and we keep putting it off. So let's address that first. Why are we putting it off? It's a rabbit hole and it's a complex rabbit hole. And it's um, it's partly dictated by it, the 8th edition 40k rules. I would add to that that I think on top of that, I worry about potentially adding to the hobby police aspect of yeah. events. And that's something we try and avoid wherever possible mm. is over-policing things now. And over-complicating things. It feels like this is really... Uh, do you know what I think it my struggle with it is? I think for me, talking about the idea of modelling for advantage comes from a place of distrust. And I work really hard to always come from a place of trust and a place of positivity. And this feels like a topic that comes from the opposite of that. I get what you're saying, actually. Because the only way modelling for advantage is a thing is if someone is inherently trying to do something that yeah, is... Yeah, they're cheating. Diso- uh, well, not cheating, but you know not, what I mean. It's, not even it's dishonest. It's, disin- it's disingenuous to the well, it's intent of... Everything. The game, good, the yeah. event. And I don't... And I think that's where I'm really struggling with it is the people who I know through events, the people who I've met through events, I actually don't want to think of any of them as potentially being the kind of person that would push the limits of the integrity of their, or I guess their integrity or the integrity of the game or the intent or... It does rely on... bordering on bad sportsmanship. Well, that's it. It relies on maliciousness. It relies on negative intent. Because if you're doing a cool conversion or you want to change something because you think it looks cool and then it gives you an advantage as a result because you've done that but you didn't set out to do that, is that modelling for advantage? And that's one of the parts of this equation. Because mm. modelling for advantage implies that you are doing something specifically to gain an advantage. If you do it because you think it looks cool and it gives you an advantage, is that still modelling for advantage? Mm, I don't know. So, let's take a step back and talk about yeah modelling, what? what it actually means and why it is even a thing. Part of the issue with modelling... So maybe we need to come up with a new term instead of modelling for advantage. That Something that basically means... Because I think modelling for advantage means modelling with the intent, intent to yeah. gain advantage. 
whereas perhaps we need to look at it as modelling with the result of advantage. Yeah, because they're two different things. They really are. Sorry. And I'd rather look at the second one than the first one. <laughs> I don't want to talk about modelling for advantage. Just don't do it. Yeah. Like, and that's, for me, that is all that you need to the say. The problem if is you're by, doing it by, to by creating the second category, though, you're essentially giving those people a shield. Yes, but I'm not because what I'm saying is I don't think... Oh, yeah, okay, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to... I can't even articulate it. Just please edit this bit out. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're talking about here is a, a result of rules changes to within the 40k game that um, the game has always used vague line of sight rather than true line of sight. And now with 8th edition, a couple of years in now, we are in a situation where we do use literal true line of sight. If I can see part of you, I can shoot part of you. Mm -hmm. And combined with some relaxed terrain rules um, we end up in a situation where um, making a model bigger or smaller has various advantages in regards to its line of sight how it's posed when you build it what base it's on um, all of these factors when you start assembling a model change its profile basically so okay here's where we start going down a rabbit hole yep because we talk about if you change its profile then you're potentially going to end up with a model that gives you advantage yet for you and I when we go around and we um, mark the painting element of it which is part of the hobby element that we're I guess trying to put some kind of tangible score on one of the things that we give extra points for is conversion mm -hmm. so and most hobby matrixes around the world do exactly so how does that work if you're in one scenario you're saying well if you're making convert <coughs> Oops, if you're making conversions, then we're going to give you extra points. But the second time, we're going to be looking at you to see whether or not those conversions are actually likely to mean that not only do you get extra hobby points, but you're potentially getting extra generalship points as well. Yeah. that And this is this is why this becomes a really weird circular argument. And the argument, to be fair, of modelling for advantage almost becomes farcical when you actually start delving into some of the examples in the rabbit hole. The really extreme ones where it is clearly an intended advantage... They're easy to spot, generally speaking. It's putting models on bigger bases when they get more attacks for more models they're in range of. It's going to a significantly bigger base because you want a bigger aura effect. It's um, but going on bigger bases to fill up ruins so you can't be charged. Because um, there's no or, specific basing, no. Um, basing charts either. Or even going to a smaller base size so, you can so that you can, deep, so you can deep strike into smaller spaces and those sorts of things. So there's plenty of those potential pitfalls with the hobby. But we've also talked about these many times in the fact that you've got some models that should be on a 40 mil base, but you put them on a 40 mil base, they're going to fall over. They need a bigger base. Yeah. And so you can't accuse somebody of modelling for advantage because they're putting them on a 60 mil base because if they don't put it on a 60 mil base, that model's going to fall over and potentially it's going to be damaged and it can damage somebody else's models. Well, certainly those big metal models in years gone by mm. were an issue. Um Things like Harlequin players are on 25 mil round bases. I'm really hoping they change those to 28s at mm -hmm. the very least, which is where the Aspect Warriors go because yeah. they're very top heavy. Yeah. Um, anything with wings that's leaping in the air wants to be on bigger bases to have a bigger footprint so that it's more stable. Mm -hmm. The higher it goes, the bigger that base needs to be. Um, there's, there's, because we don't have a, a so Age of Sigma they did right. Yeah. They gave you base sizes for everything. Why they haven't done that for 40k yet, I have no idea. The ETC have got a reasonably decent document now that's mostly up to date. It's not all up to date. The ITC took a copy of it and published it for LVO without any of the updates that it probably needed. Um, it's a really significant task. And at the moment, both of those other two documents and the one that I was working on included like a primary base size and a secondary base size to give players the ability to kind of work with older models in some cases yeah. or a great example is a lot of the space marine characters the named ones still come on 25 mil bases when the range has moved on to 32 as a minimum mm. so you have to really list those as 25s because that's what they come with but we really want you to put them on 32s because that's what they should be on mm. so um you know there's lots of those sorts of instances in 40k where i feel like if games workshop tore the band-aid off with basing and went here's your base chart 
or in the when they when they did the chapter approved with all the points values per model, mm. a separate column going base size. Yeah. And um, like a half page in that book that said, here are all the defined base sizes. Mm. And even if it was just letters, A, B, C, D, three yeah. to whatever number it needed to be. A is a 28, B yeah. is a, yeah. It would actually be pretty straightforward to do that. Um, it would be a little time consuming because you'd have to go through the whole range. But at the same time, it, It'd be it, a it solves giant a lot pain. of... It would be a giant pain in the butt if you've got to rebase your entire army. But a lot of... Um, and this is part of the modelling for advantage problem with basing is that a lot of tournaments these days say we expect you to have your models on the most current base size that that model comes with. Mm. So Terminators used to come on 25 mil bases in years gone by. I have many of them myself. They currently come on 40 mil bases. That's a significant change in base size because they, you know they, they've almost doubled. And... I've got Eldar jet bikes that came on 60 mil round bases that now come on 32 mils. Mm. Um, the Penitent engine, most recent release, came on a 60, now comes on a 50. But at the same time, those Battle Sisters came on 25s and now come on 28s and 32s, depending on which unit they're part of. So, so that's ridiculous that you've got them at the moment coming on two different base sizes. Yeah. So I can understand that in the last 30 years that yep. that's changed. But when they're both current models, both available for sale, I don't think that they should be. On, but I mean, not that my opinion makes any difference. Yeah, uh, but this is this is the hurdle that we're at. Yeah. Is that players like me for Sisters of Battle? I've got five different I, base sizes. Well, I, my army's on twenty five mils because they're from second edition. They're metal. Yeah. In theory, I need to rebase that entire army onto either twenty eights or thirty twos, depending on whether they got heavy weapons or not. You can't buy 28 mil bases at the moment either, which means for my Howling Banshees, which all my new ones are on 28s because that's what they came with, my old ones are still on 25s. Mm. If I bring my old ones, is that modelling for advantage because that's what they came with? Because... I do feel like the base size thing though, for me that doesn't feel all that particularly difficult. There are ways around going, okay, you've got that on a 25 instead of a 28 in X amount of space for 25 mil bases, you would only be able to fit this, you would be able to fit this many, sorry, put it the other way around. If you're expected to have 28 mil bases, you'd only be able to fit five in this particular space. You've got on 25 mil bases, you're only, you can only put five in there. You can't put six even if you can squeeze them in. But as soon as you start abstracting the game like that, it requires even cleaner and neater play from both players and to, for both players to be as honest with each other. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, but I think that there are there's ways around stuff like that. For me, I guess where I thought this conversation was going was around more around the um, the conversion. Oh, I haven't and, got there yet. We're going yeah, there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm touching on stuff that I saw on the weekend because my last opponent at the tournament I've spoken about, Craig, had a big unit of gene stealers. Mm -hmm. The gene stealers I bought off the shelf from Games Workshop had 32 mil bases with them. Yeah. My Prince Sling gene stealers that came with Overkill had 32 mil bases on them. His were all on 25 mil because that's what they shipped with. And when I looked on the website, that's according to the website what they should ship with. So I mine were on 32s, mm. his were on 25s. And from what I can gather, his are right. What do you do? That's the problem. Mm. That, that right there is the issue when you get a mispack or as a player, like I don't check the back of the box to see what base it says it's supplied with. You, we opened that Age of Sigma box and it came with 40 mil bases and 32 mil bases. Mm. And, I, and there were two separate bags of them and one had five bases in it and the other had 10 bases in it. And there were five Stormcast and eight, blood, um, eight Bloodborne. Mm. Pretty logical where those bases are going when there's only five Stormcast and there's yeah. five 40 mil bases. Well, not necessarily because why give you 10 for the, a squad with eight? Well, they gave you because they're coming I, packs of 10. Yeah. But... <laughs> but you know what I mean, yeah. though. So the, the base sizing it is, thing. It is Games Workshop, and bless their cotton socks. It's very likely that they could pack you five bases when you've got eight models. Yeah. Stuff like Look, that e happens. Even the Scourges, my, my Drakari Scourges, there were two boxes on the shelf. When I watched this particular person open them in the store to, to build them, bought two of them, one had 32s in it, one had 25s in it, because they used to come on 25s, and yeah. then they got updated to be 32s. What, what does that player do then? And at that point, you have to make a call. And that if you're in the store doing that, he's the, his natural response to the store manager. Which do they go on? Give me a minute. I'll Google yeah. it. 
And at that point, you start going well. Which is all well and good if they've got another box in store. Yeah, I mean, or a lot of the time, the, that they a lot of the time, the stores will, will make make sure you get the right bases anyway. Yeah. But um, yeah, the, the basing side of things represents the first hurdle, and we've talked about it before. Where if you go to bigger bases, you like we said earlier, you take up more space on the board. It's easier to block deep strike. You get bigger or areas of effect for auras. But we do have workarounds for that. Yeah, and most players are pretty reasonable when they come to that sort of thing and go, "Hey, we want to do this." It's a cool conversion. This is what I want to do. And, um, you know, knocking half an inch off an aura to take into account the base space. I've come up with a solution mm. for the whole modelling with advantage. You're going to love it. Go on. So Games Workshop have to include, with every box that they make, a cardboard silhouette of what the model should look like. And then every time you stick it behind a wall, you have to put your cardboard silhouette there and go, can you see the cardboard? Yep, then you can hit me. Can you see the cardboard? Nope, you can't hit me. There we go, done. <laughs> Not as silly as you might think. I don't think it's silly, I think it's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but at that point, you might as well just play with cardboard. Well, yeah. but and I'd rather pay $50 for five plastic marines than $50 for five cardboard cutouts. 100%. <laughs> but I, I guess I was thinking around the going back to when when it first started and there were cardboard cutouts and that kind yeah, of stuff. from the second like, second edition box set. At least when you knew, when you had that, you know that... And same with some of the board games that we've got that come with the cardboard cutouts that yeah. sit in a little slot. You know what that actually... What the silhouette of it should look like. It's was, all well and good for us going, okay, well, we have to make it look roughly the same silhouette and that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, this would give you the idea of knowing what that silhouette looks like. Well, once we get past some of the... Maybe you can cut it out of the front of the box. Once we get past some of the silhouette conversations and the okay, conversions in a second, I actually want to talk about some of the past editions of the game where they do use that sort of mentality because most of these issues that are coming up with modelling for advantage these days come from the fact we use true line of sight. Mm, yeah. If we weren't using true line of sight, if we went back to an abstracted version of it, modelling for advantage goes away because um, I'll use 5th edition as the example. Infantry were Category 2. Mm. Monsters and tanks were Category 3. Swarms and some little monsters were Category 1. Buildings were always Category 3. Forests were always Category 3. Yeah. Um, and it didn't matter how you posed that model. If you were an infantryman who was Category 2 and a wall was Category 1, you could see over it. Yeah. It didn't matter whether you'd modelled that infantryman kneeling, lying down. You measured from the base, he was Category 2, he could see. Mm. So it was still true line of sight to some degree because you still had to draw a straight line between the two models. But as long as there was nothing height three in between those two height two models, it was fine. Hmm. So, and Infinity uses a similar sort of silhouette system as well to get rid of some of those line of sight issues to allow that some of that freedom of hobby. Um, and I think that Games Workshop's version in 5th edition was too antiquated and too simple. I think somewhere in between lies a nirvana of line of sight rules that would actually make the game interesting and dynamic while still retaining its ease of use. Because right now... I wonder, if would you have to um, give two different measures though? So, for example, you talked about if you had an infantryman who doesn't matter if they're kneeling down, laying down yep. or standing up, they can see over that wall. The thing... and. If you're aiming at that infantryman, it doesn't matter if they're sitting down, kneeling down, laying mm -hmm. down or standing up, you can see them. And one of the things that I hear around why uh, female characters or female models shouldn't be modelled wearing uh, provocative clothing is because in real-time um, combat, yep. she wouldn't go in wearing a corset and a pair of high heels. No. I'm not sure why there's an issue with a corset and a pair of high heels and yet the dude who's just wearing a wolf cape and, you know, that's okay, but but that's different a totally topic. different topic and I'm not going to go there. Um, but so they talk about the in, you know, if this was real, then she wouldn't be wearing that. If this was real, then the reality is that if this was real, he could kneel down yeah, and, take and he cover. could stand up. Yeah. So, or she could kneel down and she could stand up. So would you need to have two different measures that says if you're taking cover, you can go between a like a 0.5 and a yeah, something. Yeah, the scale has to be adjusted if you start. But if you're yeah. a tank, you've only got one because you can't get bigger. Or smaller. Or smaller. That's it. 
you know, tanks is, a tank is a tank is a tank. But an infantry an infantryman or a titan that has the ability to crouch down, but a titan doesn't. I don't know whether or not a titan can lay down. No. Less likely to be able to get back up again afterwards. Yeah, I'm no, imagining. No. Once they're down, they tend to stay down. Mm. But you know what I mean. Do you so need to kind of look at something like that, or is that adding? Is that making it more complicated? I like the intent. Um, I think when you it, you're taking a kind of a, the, the models in my mind when you are talking about this sort of abstracted line of sight rule become a little bit abstracted as well in that they that represents the fact that they're moving and ducking and kneeling and it, it's a location space more than anything. What needs to happen in conjunction with a line of sight change is also the way terrain works. There's an there's an interaction that has to change with the way terrain works as well. At the moment, um, terrain can't grow. No, well, I suppose it can if it's trees. trees. You play long Maybe enough. Maybe a hill. Um, <laughs> Some sand dunes. <laughs> can shift erosion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, what you would end up having to do with the terrain rules is to go back to something like the older editions of the game where... Sorry, we've just got this mental picture of climate change and all of the ice on our snowboards melting and we've now got a river. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, you, would, you would have to um, go back to something like if there was terrain between you and I, cover would be applied. Mm. You couldn't have this weird abstraction with terrain that we kind of have at the moment where if if it's not a, if it's, a, it's not an area of terrain or it's not a ruin you don't get cover at the moment you can have you stood in the open me stood in the open and a forest in between you and i and as long as neither of us are in it or touching it there's no cover bonus yeah that doesn't make sense no because i i mean in the real world i've never been to a forest where i've tried to work out where one of my kids is and i'm shouting them and the trees jumped out of the way so i can see my kid yeah exactly but maybe I haven't been going to the right forest. Who knows? In the year forty thousand, maybe the trees do jump out of the way. So I'm sure some they of them don't do want it. To get shot on some occasions. I'm sure they do. If a tree falls in a forest. If a tree jumps out of your way in a forest, <laughs> did it really happen? So I think the line of sight and the terrain rules kind of go hand in hand in addressing a large chunk of this issue. Mm. Because as soon as you take away true line of sight and start adding these sort of scaled silo, like they used to be known as the silo sizes, one, two, and three. And it's not good. We're trying to reduce silos in the gaming community. <laughs> <laughs> but it led to other issues as well because you had a forest that was Category 3 because that was as high as it went mm-hmm. and you had a plane that was Category 3 which meant you couldn't shoot the plane behind the forest even though it's a plane. Yeah. Whereas with True Line of Sight and a lot of the modern terrain that we're seeing in tournaments these days, the buildings are high enough to literally hide the plane which still feels intrinsically wrong to me when they're inside the ruin. So there has to be, I feel like the game is more accessible because it's more intuitive because you go, can I see it? Yes, I can see it. Cool, you can shoot it. Is it realistic that you would have, and I know that this is a game and even though it's 40K not fantasy, it is still a fantasy game and science fiction game, that kind of thing. Is it realistic that in the real world you could hide a plane or a tank behind a building. Or well, obviously a tank can. Um, and a plane, it depends on the plane. I mean, I would say an attack helicopter, something that was intrinsically able to hover, a Harrier jump jet maybe, but that would obviously give away its presence. Both of those potentially would. I'm not 100% um, sure you could hide a 747 behind the Bankwest building. No, I'm thinking more of things like um, an F-14 or a Tomcat, you know, mm-hmm. those sorts of attack aircraft, mm-hmm. air-to-air combat. They can't hide behind a plane, a building. Because they're too fast. But For those brief moments there, when they're behind a building, obviously you can't see them. And this is this all comes back to scale again. Because if if forty k is only taking fractions, like if each turn is a fraction of a second, then the, okay, I'm not going to admit why I thought it would be okay to put a plane behind a building. Have you just thought about it? Oh yeah, no, I'm I'm totally with you now, but. At, couple of minutes ago, I was like, oh, no, I can think, I can see maybe that could work. Mm, yeah, maybe not. No, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> so the other part about this whole line of sight debacle is the whole, I've got an antenna, I can shoot you from my antenna that's just poking up over the hill and I can see your wingtip that's poking around the corner of your grav tank so we can shoot each other. And that, again... And if your gun is at the top of your antenna, then I think that's fine. <laughs> But if your gun isn't at the top of your antenna, then I really don't know how you're going to shoot with your antenna. Mm. Unless it's got a laser beam. So again, I'd I'd have to say you go back to abstractions where you say, um, 
the vehicles have these weapons and you give them locations or give them um you know points where they are shooting from so you'd list a weapon as a sponson weapon or a turret weapon or a hull weapon we give them four or five categories whatever it needs mm. coaxial um pintle whatever they are when you give them those classifications you can say pintle mounted weapon may shoot in any direction um at its height category mm-hmm. sponsons may shoot directly in front directly behind or anywhere on the side where they're mounted but they can't shoot. It's essentially a 180 degree fire arc. And I know that people listening to this are going, oh, you just bring back fire arcs. But I think you can you can mine it with heights and things. And it would make the game more technical again. And I know that's not what they're trying to do. But I feel like the best solution is actually to go back and add it a little bit more technical to it. But would that hurt the game in its long term? Probably. See, for me, I just think wherever your weapon is, or wherever wherever that could that weapon could realistic. I don't want to use the word realistic, but you know, realistically be at that particular time is where you should have to measure from. So, for example, if you if you have a if you, oh, if you've got an infantryman who's holding a like a gun in his hand, yeah, the highest you should be able to shoot, like you should have to draw a line of sight from wherever his arm is. Well, that then allows me to go back to modelling for advantage. Well, that, and that's what we're talking about. That's the point, isn't it? Yeah, modelling for advantage. So the the rules used to ha- say you drew line of sight from the model's eyes because you can obviously bring a yep. gun up to aim. Yep. The first thing that happened in the community was there's a bunch of models that actually don't have eyes. Yeah, yeah. Well. <laughs> so yeah, you have to kind of say the you know the head, I suppose, is the best way to describe it. Um. But anyway, I want to go back and actually talk about what we're dealing with because how we fix it is yeah, and that's a complex, what I was about to a say. complex I, issue. We have no ability to fix no. this. That's well beyond our control. But I've, we've spent a lot of time talking about it and trying to – like there are ways that could this could be fixed relatively simply. But we have no power of control no. over that. Um, so at the moment, the biggest complaint I see for modelling for advantage these days is um, models like the suppressors or Shrike. Suppressors come on those um, – sort of concurve um, clear plastic flying stands. So they're a jump pack troop, but they come on the these newfangled... U, no, they're not U-shaped. They're kind of they're just like slightly a, arced clear plastic stands, yeah. which in my humble hobbyist opinion are garbage. And that is irrelevant to the conversation. And if How, you, No, well, it is relevant. Let me finish. Your opinion is not my relevant. My opinion isn't relevant. However, my opinion is shared by a number of hobbyists who either don't like the clear stands... Or find them difficult to work with. That's very different to saying that they're garbage. They're garbage because I agree with those opinions. Um, now, the models if you like come them, that's with fine. those, and if you happen to, if they come with them yeah. and you like them and you want to it's use them, it's your hobby. Do what you that's like. That's completely fine. Absolutely. Anyway, so what happens with those suppressors is people turn around. I'm just going to keep going. Um, and they just they they decide they either don't like them, they are too fragile for whatever reason. They choose not to use them. People then put these suppressors essentially standing on the ground. Instant modelling for advantage complaint because now it's not as high as it should be. Yes. Okay. And I know that you've got more, and I'm cutting you off. The, I guess the thing is, does one negate the other? So it's it's instant modelling for advantage because it's not as high as it was, mm-hmm. and therefore doesn't stick out above different mm-hmm. terrain the flip side of that is that it can't see over that terrain either nope so does one positive outweigh the negative and does it actually come back to it equal standing well it has a second positive that you might not have considered quite probably <laughs> it, that model can now fit into and under ruins where it wouldn't normally be able to fit in some situations so it actually now has an ability to enter spaces where it might not have been able to fit prior so that that change in size is actually a significant one when you, you can reduce its volume. Mm. So the second component of, um, of modeling for advantage in a similar vein is models like uh, Captain Shrike, oh, Chapter Master Shrike now, uh, or the new Shadow Sun model. Both of these models are coming, sort of jumping or standing on big ruined pieces yeah. of terrain. Because, of course, I think that in an actual... They would um, carry those around with them. They'd carry the rock around so they can stand there and preen on the top and jump repeatedly. (laughs) Shrike is the better example of the two because you've got all these new Primaris characters 
and you've you've seen um, Agatone from the Salamanders, and you've got the new Kalgar, and we've had the new Tigerius, and we've had all these you know awesome new models, um, Khan, everyone, and then Shrike. Now Shrike is still a Primaris Marine; he's still the same size and scale, and, and all the rest of it. He has a jump pack. He's the only one of them to have a jump pack. He's also the only one of them stood on a giant ruin. Mm-hmm. Why? should it not be okay for a player to put him not on the ruin when the ruin is actually a separate piece and put him on the ground when all of the other space marine characters are the same mm-hmm. the instant response for most players is that's modeling for advantage because you're making him smaller because he's harder to spot and he now fits in spaces where he shouldn't be able to fit if you built him the right way now the right way is a weird one because the right way implies that me having an opinion and building it the way I want to build it is wrong <laughs> And it also implies that that model wouldn't, if it was an actual person, wouldn't be able to climb down off that rock. Yeah. And and so, but same with the dudes suppressors. On the, um, yeah. You know, do they not have the ability to turn that off so they can walk on yeah. the ground? Yep. So. And that's because my that's it's what I know I've talked about it before, but my brain needs that kind of stuff that if this was real, then this is what would be able to happen. Yeah. And so you'd be able to have the choice between going up high or coming down low. And it's, I guess that's the same with an infantryman has the option to stand up, kneel down or lay down. Yeah. Depending on the situation. Yep. There's, um, and it starts getting really interesting when you start looking at the official kits because when you start converting things and reposing them, you can, you can probably argue modelling for advantage to some degree it gets a lot harder when you're not converting the kit. So by that I mean, let's say you choose to build a Tau Crisis suit and you build it without modifying it in any way, shape or form, you can build it kneeling. Mm -hmm. You can also build it posed on one leg with arms in the air Mm -hmm. with missile pods mounted on the end of its arms or plasma rifles mounted on the end of its arms and give it an extra inch and a half in height. Neither of those is... Mod- modifying the kit in any way, shape, or form. The Riptide is a great example of this. The Riptide, yeah. the standard instructions tell you how to build it as it looks on the box. Yeah. They also tell you how to build it kneeling in yeah. the instruction kit. Yeah. If I build it in the instructions following Games Workshop's directions, build it kneeling, and my other two are built standing, am I modeling for advantage? Okay. So, let's... Go all the way back to the beginning mm-hmm. to where I said I struggle with the idea of having this con- this conversation around modelling for advantage yep. because for me it's got this inherent feeling around uh, – I don't want to say it, but – neg- It's a negative. It's negative yeah. and it's to the point of cheating. Mm. I think that it's Well, you're trying to gain an advantage. On. Yeah. Okay, no, I don't want to – what I'm trying to differentiate between is when I hear the term modelling for advantage, I think for me it has mental connections with – Win at all costs and cheating. Right. Right. Now, I want to flip that on its head and ask you, what's wrong with trying to build your army for an advantage? When you're putting together your army list, do you not look at an army list and go, what is going to be the strongest possible army that I can put together? Mm -hmm. So if my strongest possible army, if I have made a decision that my strongest possible army has things being as small as possible so that they can hide, is there something wrong with that? Or say I've made a decision that my that I want to have my models being as big as they possibly can so that they can see over different things so that they can try and shoot at things. Is there anything wrong with that? I think the answer to that question lies in the social contract. Because I feel like if I'm playing with my mates and I try and make this sneaky kneeling sniper army of Raven Guard and I spend the time converting them all to be kneeling and all the rest of it, as long as my group understands that social, why it's been done and all the rest of it... Can I just stop you for a second? Mm. When you talk about it, did you hear yourself using the word sneaky? Well, no, I'm not using it as an... I'm using... No, Raven Guard are sneaky. That's their MO. But I guess... I, the way that it came out is that it was being sneaky to make them no, no, kneel. No, no, I wasn't referring to my behaviour. I was referring to the style of the army. So I'll change that. I w- I'm not trying to pick on... No. I'm not trying to pick you up, but I'm just I'm just trying to really pick apart this, this topic around modelling for okay. advantage and hear 
how the different the Raven, things that we put in and how that impacts the way we think about it. Yeah, but the Raven Guard example wasn't referring to the tactic. It was referring to the army because the army are an infiltration army. And I heard it as being sneaky because because of the way you said sneaky and kneeling made, made to me, it made it feel as though so, you were saying they were being sneaky because you were no, doing them all kneeling. No. So um, the Tower Range has kneeling fire warriors. And the, there are kneeling legs for the Astra Militarum. Mm. So if I take the time to go to a web store or I'm crazy and just go and buy box after box after box to get all those kneeling legs that I need. Or you cut them off and you're even crazier and actually convert start the way sculpting that and all the rest used of it. to. And, yep. you know, we had to cut at the joints and then try and create a knee and that kind of stuff. Or, yep. or a cloak to cover the knees <laughs> so you can't tell. I'm trying to avoid the conversion thing at the okay. moment. I'm trying to make it so that... I'm not doing anything other than using Games Workshop parts. And you can't do that with every kit, but these are the ones I can, off the top of my head, I can think of. So I go and buy myself X many dozens of legs of Cadian Shock Troopers that are kneeling. Mm -hmm. I then assemble my Cadian Shock Troops with their LAS guns, put the, the bodies on the legs, glue them to their bases, and I now have a 1700s era, first rank fire, second rank fire, front line of guardsmen that are kneeling. And then a rank behind them that's standing. Mm. Uh, I've done that because it's thematic. It looks cool, but if I have the entire army kneeling, they've they've taken a knee. Where it, you know, mm. there's no conversions there. They're all standard parts. They're all somewhat available. Admittedly, at a significant cost and time. If I model them that way. What what's what's the issue with that? Are you asking me? Yeah. Because well, that's my point. I don't see an issue with it. So, if there's no issue with me doing that, um, now obviously, like you say, line of sight becomes an issue and those sorts of things. I actually feel like most infantry models escape a lot of this scrutiny because, um, you can make, um, say you make a. Uh, Grey Knight Grandmaster, give him a Psy Cannon and a Halberd. There's nothing stopping you putting his arm raised, plastic kit, no conversion, arm raised with the Halberd pointed to the sky in salute of the enemy that makes him an inch and a half taller than he should yeah. be and I can draw a line of sight from the top of the Halberd to shoot you mm. with his Psy Cannon that's down at his waist. Yeah. So, and this is kind of where the modelling for advantage gets really muddy and I'll keep using modelling for advantage because it's... It's what we know. Yeah. So I get your, um, you want to differentiate it with intent. Mm. And I, I would actually argue that most of these situations aren't intentionally looking for an advantage. They're doing it because it looks cool or because they want to do, you know, do something different and they want to make the models their own. And ultimately modeling for advantage is about hobby policing. It's the same mm. thing about policing base sizes. It's about policing paint jobs. It's about policing any of the bits and pieces that we as organizers have to in order to give everyone the same playing field. And that's where modeling for advantage kind of stems from, is a mentality of everyone having the same um, playing field to work within. At least for me, that's what it feels like. So... I'm not disagreeing with you. It's just the more I think about this, the more confused I get and yeah. the more... The more I'm struggling, I'm, and I knew that this was going to be a difficult topic to talk about because it is. I do find it really difficult. I do. Look, it gets really murky as well because, like we've already spoken about, the riptide kneeling versus standing, yeah. and that's something that I guess I hear a lot about. Is the riptide is one that it's a great is example, a great example, yeah. So either the riptides or the models that come with these elaborate bases, and again, going back to what I was saying about the painting scores. We give extra points if people have got their special characters on fancy, special bases. Fancy bases, yeah. So and Games Workshop those... sell a kit that is literally a hero basing kit. Mm -hmm. Now, there's one base in there in particular. It's a 40 mil round base, and it's a set of stairs that trail up to a platform. It's yeah. probably an inch in height, maybe a bit less. Yeah. And the model that they put on top of that is a Terminator Librarian in the photo. Yeah. yeah. If someone rocks up to a tournament with their character stood at the top of those stairs... It's a 40 mil base, so you can put Terminators up there. You can put most of the Primaris characters up there, Marnius Kalgar, any of those ones should fit up on the top of that. Are they modeling for advantage? Because they've increased the height of their model, so he's going to be harder to hide, but he's a character, so you can't target him anyway. 
But now for his line of sight, when he shoots at things, he's getting all the advantages. Yeah. Now, he's he's not... U- so, um, most of the TOs I speak to say they assume the model is on the base size supplied, not necessarily... The height. The height. And obviously, if you start saying that Shrike can't come off of his rubble and be mounted on the mm. ground, surely the reverse of that is also true. Mm. You shouldn't be able to raise models on bases in any way, shape or form. Or in that situation, and I know I'm going back to a trying to fix it where we have no ability to try and fix it, but do you go, you know what, if you're putting him on a hero base, you have to pay additional points in order to do that because or, your model is getting advantage that you're not paying for. But this is why I like the original 5th edition with the sort of size categories because yeah, then it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so you've got that. That Which is doesn't a, often happen. <laughs> so that's another sort of foible, you know, fly in the ointment. The third one that I'll use is um, a lot of the skimmer models, grav tanks, jet bikes, um, land speeders, all of those sorts of things. 99.9, I've, I've never had a kit that hasn't come with it, but I'm sure there's one lurking around there somewhere. They come with two sizes of flying stand. Generally speaking, it's a short one and a long one. If I choose to put my grav tanks on the short one or the long one, because they don't tell you which one to use, the instructions say pick one, is one or the other modeling for advantage. Mm. It comes with a kit, no modifications, no conversions, no nothing. Where if I put it on the small one and now it's low enough that it sits behind a wall so you can't see it, or if you'd put it on the tall one, I'd be able to see it. Mm. Oh, awesome. Why should I put it on the tall one? Oh, because if you don't, you're modeling for advantage. Well, no. I, I, I tend to put my grav tanks on the short ones personally because they're more stable. The stand's less likely to be broken. They're easier to store. They're easier mm-hmm. to pack. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's preferences there that are practical more than anything else. Um, I know there's a whole bunch of players that don't even put them on flying stands and go yeah. to tournaments like that because mm-hmm. you measure to the hull. So why do I need a base? Yeah. Um, and then there's other people who try and tow the line with some of these grab vehicles where it says you measure everything to the hull so they get the tallest possible flying stand to make mm. sure the, the hull isn't more than an inch above the ground. That's so now it. you so can't you charge can't. it. Yeah. Now, as a TO, I'd never allow that. Like, that is um, th- that is just a dick move, basically, to try and claim that that is an unchargeable vehicle. But in the rules, that's what the rules say. Yeah, I don't know. I can almost see that. I can almost see that as okay. In the rules, it makes like in yeah. the rules, it works. But at that point, if you use the long stem, are you modelling for advantage? You should have put it on the short stem, so I can be able to charge you. It's not fair that I can't charge you. You, you see what I mean? I, I totally see what you mean. And the problem is, there's no consistency there because that- there's flips to both of these scenarios, yeah. and players seem to get hung up on you're trying to get an advantage out of what you're doing. When 99% of the time, there's an equal disadvantage or the player in question is doing it for practical reasons or they're just doing it because they think it looks cooler. Mm. And most of the time, there's examples in the opposite vein that show the the counterpoints. And so you end up in this circular farce of an argument where you see it on Facebook all the time. Hey, these are my suppressors. Do you feel a little bit like that's what this conversation is? Yeah. (laughs) But this is highlighting the issue in that most players I see online get on there and go, that's modeling for advantage. Why? Because it's not the same height as the proper model. And every time I've gone back to them and gone, okay, proper model, cool. What about the Riptide? Mm. What about the flight stands on a jet bike or a, you know, a grav tank? Most players just bow out of that argument immediately because they don't have an answer for that that fits with their their version of what they think is all right within yeah. the, the modeling spectrum. And there aren't, no, there aren't any answers to it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I'm right and they're wrong. I'm saying that there's a lot of players who seem to see this as a black and white thing and it can't be. I see. I've, I struggle to see black and white at the best of times. Everything is gray. You know, I am a fairly black and white yeah, kind of are. person. This is why we never agree on anything. You're black and white. I'm... Was it 50 shades of grey? No, I was say, what's the Pantone thing? For, how many shades are there in oh, there? Oh, there's a lot in the Pantone yeah, colour like range. 2,957 shades of grey. But, but this is my point, is that in this particular case, when you actually factor in the line of sight rules and the terrain rules, you end up in a situation where there is no right or wrong answer to the modelling the modeling thing. Mm. 
Because as soon as you choose to build a model that doesn't look exactly like the box, if you raise a power fist to the from a Terminator to the stars in salute, if you tilt the arm on that um, uh, on that wraith um, wraith lord or wraith knight with its sword angled up instead of down, mm. without modifying the kit in any way, you change its silhouette and its profile, which immediately has an impact on the game. For bigger or smaller, it'll always change the game. The first game I played. On the weekend with Ryan, mm. Ryan's knight. Now I have to give full props to Ryan because he was a gentleman with all of the line of sight stuff. He was really awesome because his knight is stood. It's an Iron Warrior's knight, and it's stood on a trench that's two inches tall. He totally models for advantage. <laughs> <laughs> now my warlockers wanted to shoot a unit past the knight, but because he'd modelled this trench that it was walking over and yeah. the angle the knight was on, I couldn't see those models. Yeah. And I got down at the height and went, okay, if that base wasn't there... Would I be able to see I, it? I could see them. And he looked at it and went, yeah, 100% agreed, go for it. Yeah. Because if he'd built it on the right size base, there was a bit of a nice gap between the legs and the missiles would have, you know, not a problem. Yeah. The flip side of that is later in the piece, he was shooting a warp bolter or a, a relic bolter. It was um, on a Chaos Space Marine. And the model had its fist. He literally had a clenched fist and a bolter. The clenched fist was just out in a window. So that's where he was drawing line of sight from. Because the th- the model's there, mm. the fist's there. And like I said, I had no problems with it because mm. that's the way the rules work. Mm. Now, that particular model, again, that fist doesn't come with that model. Yeah. It was a cool conversion that he did. It's a, you know, it's a mailed fist of chaos. Is that modeling for advantage at that point? It's such a it's such a grey rabbit hole of an argument that it's and it's circular. You end up going around and around and around arguing the same points. Well, we've been talking about this stuff since when did what, we're going, two years? We're going forty plus minutes now with no, you know, just giving examples and going. Well, what do we do? How do we? Yeah, yeah. So the only way to actually resolve it within the standard rules of the game as it sits right now is to actually standardize the models and go yeah. cool every single space marine is going to be exactly the same if they're armed with an auto bolt rifle this is what they look like the end because then there's no mm-hmm. and i'm sure people are still complain because oh mine's twisted at 60 degrees when you're firing at it if it's twisted at 45 degrees it's bolter doesn't stick out from the end of the yeah but the thing was yeah i yeah that's exactly it but mm. <laughs> So yes. the, and, and this is the problem with modeling for advantage. Intended or not, any change to a model results in a change in the game. No matter how small it is, you'll put a purity seal on the shoulder pad of a space marine and that purity seal will be flapping in the breeze and it'll look amazing and then one day it'll be on the table and that purity seal will be sticking out. And you can shoot from your purity s- seal. And be shot back at it in return. And, that's, so, and I do find that ridiculous. Yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah, I really do. I'm sorry. What have you attached to that purity seal that you can now shoot from it? And if somebody happens to shoot your purity seal, what's the biggest damage it's going to do? It's ripped your ribbon. Oh, dear. <laughs> like, One of the biggest things that um, I find helps me get over those sorts of little things is um, you, you actually haven't seen the game. It's called Dawn of War. It's an old uh, real-time strategy game on the PC for 40K. You, I've seen the cover for that. Yeah. Um, when you actually, there's a, an attack move in that game where you can select a unit, tell it to go to a certain point, and every time it finds an enemy while going to that point, it stops and attacks. Mm. And that's kind of the way I view 40k in that um, a tank with its tail, like the tail of a tank sticking out from behind a, ve- a building that shoots you, isn't firing from I get it. the yeah, tail it of that building. Duck in and it's out rotating and, that and moving and swiveling yeah. and shooting, and it's an abs- there's a slightly abstracted process in that yeah. the problem what they've done is they took away all the when we had firing arcs and we had facings for armor and we had all those technical things for vehicles we had abstract line of sight now we've got true line of sight and we've got abstracted rules for and that's where i'm struggling with it i'm struggling with it because i hear what you're saying if you've got you know if it you should can, either be all abstract or, or it should be or, all true yeah so you know you've got this purity seal that's flapping in the breeze so the reality is that somebody could duck from behind that building they, and then duck back in again. Yeah, and the but the, the reality, reason you can shoot back at them is that moment in time that they're out when for a they're split out. Second. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I get it. But then it's the same thing with them being able to bob up at a window and bob back down again. Yeah, you know. So that I guess that's where I struggle with it. They're either 
as you said, you've got both abstract and true, true, just mushed in together, and I don't know how to and that and that's fix it. And that's what they've done since time immemorial. And with eighth edition, if they'd if they'd kept the previous line of sight rules and the previous terrain rules, but given us everything else, the game works. And I really think that it comes down to. Um, and I've only met a few of them, so I really have no ability to be able to say this with any kind of conviction or um, any authority. But I think the people who are creating this game are narrative players yeah, rather than competitive players. There's definitely a level of inferred knowledge with rules, which is why we've got pages of FAQs now. And there's inferred intent within the, the rules. That's it. It's that inferred intent. And and because of that, because yeah, because of that, you end up with these... It's not even grey. There's just it's just mud. mush. <laughs> it's muddy brown. Mm. Yeah, I'm good with grey, but I don't like brown. <laughs> no, because it's normally something that has to be cleaned up. <laughs> <laughs> but that 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 is, and that's kind of the the point of this conversation was to highlight the fact that there is no right or wrong. There is no, um, and it's all driven back to the rules. We've got or lack of. Or uh, the fact that there are rules for both parts of it, it's just that one belongs in another, they belong in different editions. Mm. So, claiming that someone's modeling for advantage by changing their model in any way, which is ultimately any what, what any conversion does, suddenly you, you, you know, you, you, I built, just built 20 Wraith Guard with swords, uh, 10 with sword, dual swords and 10 with axes and shields. If I build them on the box, they're all kind of posed in like a dueling stance, mostly. Yeah. Some of mine are walking, striding, and they've got their swords by their sides. Some of them are, are twisted out at the wrists, like in a come-at-me pose. Some of them are crossed swords in front of them. Every single one of them has a different silhouette. Mm. There's 20 of them. There's not one of them that is the same as the other because they're multi-part kits and I can build them that way. Is me building them in a variety of poses modeling for advantage? Hmm. Or is it just because you get bored painting the same thing over and over well, again? Well, that's it. They're already they're already exactly the same model yeah. ten times over. So at least if they're in different poses, so you can get three different. And I know that's how psychologically you get yourself through painting some of those bigger squads. Okay, I'm going to do all the ones that are in this pose, and I'm going to get this particular layer down on them today. Okay, I'm going to finish all the ones that are in this one, and then okay, I can't look at those ones anymore. I'm going to look at the ones who have got this yeah. particular. So, yeah. Different things to get you through. <laughs> Same with space brains. Space brains are the epitome of repetitive painting. Mm. And our son said the same thing. He painted 20 intercessors and went, I don't want to paint these ones anymore. Mm. Good job he's not painting orcs. But the, ne- but the funny thing is he's got six more intercessors there to paint. He's done head swaps on all of them. He's converted all of them. Mm. Now, the head swaps are a third-party piece. And um, they've all got head crests on their helmets. Makes them... Five mils taller. Um, the sergeant for that squad has no helmet. It's from a, the head comes from another kit, mm. but he's got a thunder hammer. If he models that wa- striding purposefully towards him, thunder hammer by his side, compared to running at you, thunder hammer mm-hmm. raised in the high. air. Yeah, it's a, both of them are conversions. I suspect that there's not a single player in the world who screams modeling for advantage when you take things off flying stands or off ruins that would complain about a thunder hammer wielding space marine posed in either of those ways. And that's the other part of this problem is that there's no consistency in the application of the There's no consistency complaint. with complaining. No. <laughs> and it sounds dumb to say it, but that's exactly true. People are willing to complain about things that are it's super... It's more noticeable, ob- yeah. Yeah, it's super obvious, whereas moving an arm left or right or up or down, the model still looks like it's the model. Mm. And, but why should they be exempt from those changes? If I model my Wraith Lord kneeling, people cry blue murder because it's significantly smaller. It drops in, drops in height by probably an inch, maybe more. Yeah. Uh, if I model it running, even though that does change its height a little bit, not by much, but it does change it a little bit, um, it certainly changes the profile of the rest of the pose mm. because you tend to running tends to be a narrower vertical pose than... Yeah. Uh, you know, legs astride type pose. Well, not only that, but you also, for me, I would move where the arms are as well. So you're ending up with 
Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Well, the legs come come in and the arms go forward and backwards and stuff like Instead that. Instead of so left and do, right. Yeah. yeah. Now, the kneeling version requires a lot of cutting and measuring and yeah. messing about. The running one requires almost no cutting and mucking about with. It but requires a little bit, but nothing like the kneeling. Mm. And even the standing ones... Um, you get weird stuff like um, the Wasp Walker from Forge World. It's a variant War Walker. The War Walker kit has two fixed legs. The Wasp Walker comes with an upper and a lower leg, and the ankles are all posable, which means that you can model a Wasp Walker standing, running on one leg, jumping through the air, crouched low, sliding to one side. It even comes with a really tall flying stand. like a, It's a four-inch flying stand. Now, the instructions you get in Forge World kits of this age are not the best. And there's nothing in the instructions that tells you you have to use that flying stand. But it comes with it. Mm. Now, I I personally detest those sorts of flying stands. So, all of my wasps are modeled running or striding or I've got one that's kind of... Um, <laughs> I'd been watching Robotech. So, it's posed um, with its sort of legs wide apart braced to shoot. Mm. Um. All three of them are uh, probably within a centimetre in height in terms of height differences because the ones that are running, there's one that's quite tall, there's one that's leant forward and there's the, like I say, the one that's braced to fire. So they're all roughly the same height but they are, there are differences. So which one of those is the advantage? So yeah, it's... I, I really don't know how else to articulate just how ridiculous the argument for modelling for advantage actually is. I told you that we should have taken on the um, fixing the world with either Brexit or the um, coronavirus this week <laughs> because this was too hard. <laughs> yeah. I, I I really don't know what else to say on this topic. It's. I think we've exhausted it. Yeah. I And this is, I said it to someone else, I said the whole argument's a farce. It's not a farce. It's just, it's it's cyclical. We're just going around and around in circles and there's so many different different ways of looking at basically the exact same thing. The reality is, it's just a game. Yep. Have fun. And when you come to an event, the organisers will... It's really trying hard to wrap that up there. Well, it's important to talk about because there are still event organisers out there that sit on very hard line modelling for advantage based on the overriding um, loud potentially minority online who go oh, you've taken those off that ruin or you've taken that off that flying stand that's modeling for advantage i would encourage you as a player or as a to to actually stop and think about it for a second the next time a player comes to you and says i really prefer my suppressors hovering at ground height rather than hovering two centimeters in the air yeah. or you know what i don't like shrike stood on his ruin because he's not going to cart that everywhere. I want him to be among his friends. Like he, he's, he's, he's their boss. Like they will protect him. He won't expose himself to enemy fire. They, they are the stealth assassin. Mm. Why is he stood out exposing himself to fire? I would encourage you to stop and have a think about it and go. That modification, if the reverse was applied, would I stop that? Because if I modelled a hero onto a big heroic fancy base and you would still allow it, why are you not allowing Shrike to come off his? Mm. If you, as a player, are okay with one, in theory you have to be okay with the other. I don't, I'm don't. i not saying you have to, but in theory you should be. So, yeah, have a think about modelling for advantage in that sort of light. And I, I think you'd be, it becomes a lot more grey in your... You'll, you'll become a lot more grey in that thought process because... Or brown and muddy. Yeah, well, it is a brown and muddy topic and like we've already said, it's interlaced with a whole bunch of rules issues and a whole bunch of true versus abstract rules on top of that. So... Who knows? Maybe ninth edition is just around the corner and all of this will be fixed. Oh, God. Don't you start that garbage. That's been circulating for months now with no no tangible evidence the ninth don't don't you put it on the podcast and have people start saying that we said it no we didn't we said last time that they were that the myth the whatever about yeah, it, it had all, been debunked yeah it was it was a so, hoax no i'm not saying that i've heard that <laughs> yeah, or but anything. now people are going to sound bite okay. it okay oh my god fine <laughs> anyway 
Well, we you heard it here first. By 12th edition, <laughs> these are all going to be <laughs> sorted out. <laughs> all right. Take another look at modelling for advantage. Don't. Just ignore it. You do you. You enjoy your hobby. It is ultimately a hobby and it is your hobby. And no one has the right to tell you what you can and can't do with your models. Except for your TO. Your TO however, does actually. <laughs> however, this part of the social contract with your TO or your opponents is always going to be around, hey, these are my models. This is the way I like them. Are you okay with it? Mm. And if you're going to an event, the TO does have the right to say, no, I'm not okay with that. But maybe offer some of these examples and have a conversation. Be an adult. Don't screech and complain explain your point and you might find the TO more receptive. You might not as well, but Hmm. it's worth a shot. Anyway, on that public service announcement note, something like that, we'll, um, we'll wrap up in just a second. So as Emma said, we probably should have picked a um, less controversial and complicated topic like Brexit or something else like that to resolve this episode because um, we went around in circles for an hour. That's so unlike us. But hopefully it highlights some of the oddities of the argument and the conversation around modelling for advantage. Mm. I also would strongly... I think it highlights the, um, our thinking style, <laughs> if nothing else. I'd strongly suggest as well you actually think about um, what Emma was saying in that modelling for advantage implies a negative intent, whereas that's not always going to be the case. People don't always model things to try and gain an edge. They just do it because it's cool. Mm. And so giving people the benefit of that doubt is going to be far more conducive to having a positive experience with them if you play them than not. Like, don't get me wrong, if someone's going to be a, an idiot, modelling for advantage is going to be the least of your problems if they're going to be a genuine grade A moron at a table yeah why do you think and this is probably not a rabbit warren i should go down but why do you think when somebody looks at a model the first thing they see is modeling for advantage not wow that's a really Mm. cool conversion dude how did you do that that's what i mean a lot of work went into that yep i agree i think part of it's to do with a competitive mindset that i think also there's a bit of jealousy attached to it players not able to do some of the hobby side of like I said earlier at the start of the day there's stuff that my opponent in round two his his ability to hobby there are gaps in my mental processes that I can't do what he does with the conversions that he's done yeah and I could see some people getting really grumpy with that it's I I sort of can't understand that because I think I really wish I could I, sing. Like, I really wish I could. And I'm jealous of people that sing and sound, that's what I'm saying. sound really You've well. You've literally just highlighted it. No, let me finish. But at no point do I get upset that somebody else can sing and I can't. Yeah, but you're not competing in a singing competition. You're not competing with the other person that can sing. But you're not... Yeah, no, I think you're missing my point. So, M- Matt's it, Army is a great example of... I'm sure that he would cop flack in... And a, like an aggressive way for modeling for advantage because he has all these awesome conversions and there's the um, uh, the dune crawlers that he has. He's got three of them in the army. One of them's the standard kit, mostly the standard kit. The other one, he's only got two legs. It's on the right base, but it's only got two legs and it's like a chicken walk with all these missiles mounted on top of it. The third one is on tracks and it's this big cyborg thing, all on the same base, all with the right weapons. The silhouettes on all three of them are very different. But at the same time, he's fairly like light in regards to how you interact and play the game with those models. Like he's not, he's not going to try and claim it's it should be hidden if it can't be hidden. And like like on the weekend, he wanted to shoot his um, the chicken legged missile one at one of my planes. Is that what's written on his army list? Chicken legged missile one. <laughs> it's actually labelled as Icarus. Um, That's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> but because of the way he'd modelled it, he couldn't draw a line of sight from it to my planes. Mm. And he went, oh, I can't see it. There was no expectation of... If I'd done it the way that it should be done, then I I'd could be able to, it. so can I still do this? Exactly. Yeah. So, I, I think part of it just has to come down to your own attitude and the, the expectations you have of the attitude of your opponent. 
if you if you go in thinking they're trying to score, like to rot you, I don't think you're gonna have a good game. Mm. If you go in already negative, why are you playing? And if it's at a tournament and you've agreed to go and the tournament organizer said it's okay, why are you complaining? Okay. Now, I agree with what you're saying, but at the same time, I do think that if you have an issue, then you should tell somebody about it because if, for example, if, for example, somebody Oh, came, there's been plenty of players I've seen who go, no, no, the, the organizers said this is okay. Yeah, exactly. Are you sure? Yeah. So, really? <laughs> and if you if you come to an event and somebody is doing something really dodgy, so for example, they've got a one inch model on the table that's supposed to represent yeah. a warlord titan, then chances are we haven't said that that's okay. So, but if nobody tells us about it, well, I would hope that we'd notice that where the heck is the warlord titan on that table when we yeah. can't see it. But you know what I mean? If nobody tells us about it, then we don't know, we can't do anything about it. So you got to try and find that line. I don't know. It's difficult. Yeah. It's not an easy topic. Um, but that's it. That's it for the episode today. Mm. We're done. Um, if you've got any thoughts or feedback on this topic and what, you know, some of the examples we gave out, feel free to post comments on the Facebook page or in the uh, website below this. My thoughts and comments on this um, recording for today is that we do need to remember that when we are recording to re- remove the animals from the menagerie. Yes. So far today, we've got three dogs wandering around, sitting on us or laying on us or sitting at our feet. We've got a guinea pig that's making half much noise. And a bird. budgie that's squawking as well. My pet's quiet. Mm. She's fine. The cats are all quiet. We don't have cats. Mm. It's a good thing. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had something to talk about then. All right, sorry. You distracted me with talk of men- men- menagerie. <laughs> oh, that's typical. It's completely gone now. Is it that you're going to buy me chickens for Valentine's Day? No, you're not getting chickens for Valentine's Day. That's a shame. We'll see. <laughs> I'm expecting a box of KFC now. <laughs> <laughs> you can build a chicken. It's <laughs> modelling for advantage. I can flat pack it. <laughs> Comes in a bucket. You get four of them. Go Doubles for it. Doubles dinner. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, that's just wrong. Um, <laughs> in so many different ways. <laughs> Apologies to any vegans yeah. that we have listening. <laughs> um, it's amazing what comes out of your mouth when you're tired, and you, I'm looking at it going, I've got to go and start getting ready for varsity very shortly. Um, it's it's going to be a fun night. It's going to be a long night. Um, that was supposed to be sincere when I said it's going to be a fun it's night. It's going to be I'm great. I'm sure it came out that way. It's going to be a good night. It's, um, I've already got uh, varsity staff who are taking the night off from so other can- varsities to come to Morley and play. That's I had, awesome. I had one of the varsity managers get in touch and go, "Hey, is this still happening?" And rah, rah, rah. yeah, so, so that was um, that was an interesting conversation to have. <laughs> so, That's cool. Yeah, it's really cool. I'm not sure that varsity will be. <laughs> as long or as they're not staff are sick on the. Well, third as long Monday as they're not calling in sick, yeah. it's okay. Um, I think though that that's um, it's really bothering me. There was definitely something else I had to talk about before we um. Oh, I remember now the merch store. Ah. I wanted to mention that very briefly. Objective Secured now has its own merch store. Um, you can find a link to it on the website and we post a link to it on the Facebook page as well. Um, at the moment, it's got t-shirts and for men, for women, for kids, for babies. There's backpacks and a couple of other bits and pieces. There will be more stuff going on it as we finalize some designs and nut out some of the extra bits and pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll have t-shirts going up for... Um, for the different events. For the different events with yep. the different logos as well. You can also customise your own stuff. So mm-hmm. one of our um, uh, one of our um, followers got in touch and went, can I put my own logos and stuff on it? Absolutely. We, we are allowed to use our logo because it's our logo. Mm-hmm. Anything that's proprietary or copywritten, we can't put on that store. Anything you add after the fact is not us. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a thing that you, you you basically upload it yourself and do it yourself mm-hmm. um, but it does mean if you want to do team shirts with the obsec logo on it you can um, if you I've been talking to a couple of the other locals in Western Australia who do have their own teams and things and they were talking about um, offering their logos and stuff for shirts that you can buy from us cool so as more designs become available we will put them on there if you have any problems with the site let me know um, because I'm I actually refunded someone who bought a ticket through the old process, uh, bought a t-shirt through the old process on the website because uh. I went, look, it's going to cost you the same and 
there's less margin in it for us, but can you test this for us and make sure it works? Because I can only do so much. So um, he sent me a message this morning saying that um, he spent hours last night messing about with logos, trying to figure out which ones he wanted and cropping things and all the rest of it. And I've gone, so the website worked? He said, oh, yeah, it was fine. I just spent way too long messing about with what I could do with it. So that was nice. Wow. Depends what, whether he had stuff that needed to be done, doesn't well, it? Well, that's true. All right. On that note, though, thank you for listening. Mm-hmm. Thank you to all our patrons for their continued support. Um, we have Feb- February's event just around the corner. So the- that is Bolt Action, War Machine. There's a 40K event, Age of Sigma event. And Kill Team. And Kill Team. So five different events happening on the 22nd of February. Yep. Get your tickets ASAP. And by the time this comes out, hopefully the line breaker tickets will be available for the 13th, 14th and 15th of March. Mm-hmm. Um, this, then, then we've got like two scheduled events in April and um, watch this space for May and June. So Fab plenty, plenty, plenty more coming. Until then though, take care. Happy gaming. Enjoy yourself. Oh, you got it in this no, time. I, I, I didn't mean to. I know that's your shtick, so I'm going to let you do that now. I said it however many times and then you're like, you can't finish it without you saying it now. You have to say it. So yeah, now it I'm going to say it. Happy gaming, thing. everyone. You've been listening to the Objective Secured Podcast. If you'd like to get in touch, you can visit our website, objectivesecured.com.au. You can find us on Facebook, Facebook forward slash Objective Secured, or you can email us, obsec at optusnet.com.au. Thanks for listening.